Welcome back to our eChurch family and friends around the world. I'm not the top family. We're so grateful for all of you speaking, taking time out of your Wednesday to come and join us tonight. Take a moment, share this program with someone, and invite them into the service. If you're driving, keep your hands on the wheel, but keep your ears attentive to what the Spirit is saying to the church tonight. We're grateful for all of our friends around the world. You'll take time again to join the word tonight. I know we're in a different climate. We see the devil is still moving, seeking whom he may devour, even causing havoc in area, various parts of our country and even in Christian schools where the devil has no limit to where he wants to come in and bring about fear. But all I keep saying and all I keep believing that God is in still in full control. So we're believing God for that tonight. Let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we bless you. We thank you for your grace. You allow us to come again to share tonight. We pray that you would, Holy Spirit, be the teacher. Come into our minds and our hearts and give us instructions. We can grow thereby. Strengthen us, those families that are bereaved right now and that are hurting, those cities that are hurting for the loss of tragedy of loved ones. We pray, oh God, that you would be the God of comfort, send strength and grace and healing. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week we left off with you. We were talking about blowing the trumpet in Zion. If you've been tracking with me, you've probably been seeing that I've been leading into that lesson and that message with a couple of preludes and giving a couple of snippets. But last week I really wanted to get down into the nuts and bolts of it there in Numbers, the 10th chapter, and talk to you and I about what the Lord is saying to us, I believe, in this hour. This is the time that the trumpet is blowing in Zion. God's habitat, God's dwelling place is the church. You have not come to Mount Zion, but you come to Mount Zion, where God wants to dwell and meet us at. Um, as I started into this month of uh, March gladness, I began to seek the Lord about what is he saying to us about so as the church, as the body of believers. And I believe the Lord is saying in this to me, to us, we're gathering back together. We're, the leaders are coming together. The church is regalvanizing itself and coming back in formation. We're hearing the sound of deliverance, the sound of of, of gathering again, the sound even of God telling us how that Zebulun and, and also Issachar is going to be a blessed people. And that spirit, I pray, that graced us on those, those sons will rest upon us, that God will elevate us. And the foundation of things that God is, has taught us, we must go back to those foundational principles. The Bible says in Psalms 11 and 3, before we get started tonight, that if the foundations are being destroyed, what will the righteous do? And I've been teaching you that the foundations are our Christian values, our qualities of things that we just not, cannot get away from. One person have liberties to another, another has liberties of others, but you have to know your threshold and the things that you cannot become so liberal with, neither I, because our bodies are the temples of the living God. So we must find a greater love for God, a greater love for the body of Christ, and a greater love for ourselves as we serve the Lord in this hour. The church, the church, the church. We've been talking about it all month long. And tonight I want you to go back to a familiar scripture in Matthew 16 and verse 18. Just want that one scripture in the NIV. And we're going to build our lesson tonight. I'm going to give you a heads up. It's going to be kind of meaty and, and, and kind of a, a real uh, bitey message tonight. Uh, but you're going to track with me and stay on point. So don't jump off. Don't get bored. The game is right there. Some of you got two devices on you watching the game, listening to me and cooking food. But stay focused tonight. Matthew 16, 18. <clears throat> he says, I tell you in NIV, I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And our lessons in the middle of that uh, a scripture tonight, I will build my church, the ecclesia, this, the called out ones, um, the kilo uh, is the ones he's looking at. He's calling us out and the church is moving out as we've gone through here the past years. And now here we are looking at April. We're moving out. The year is going fast. So he's going to build his church. Let's see how Christ in these scriptures teaches us how the church is being built. I want you to move to Ephesians and look at the second chapter and verse 14, I believe, down to verse 22, but I'm not going to read all of that. But in Ephesians 14, uh, second chapter and verse 14 to 22, 
I want you just to see in that context that he talks in there about the church. We'll read it a little bit later as we go. But here the Lord is saying that he has brought now Jews and Gentiles together to make one new man, one new man. That's the purpose of him building his church. God's divine plan was to make Jews and Gentiles one new man. Sometimes you have to appreciate where you come from to remember where you come from to know where you're going. You have to appreciate where you come from to know where you are today. So building that one new man, we see it in Ephesians 2, 11 and 12 in the English Standard Bible. He says, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called uncircumcised by what is called circumcised. The uncircumcised that they called us Gentiles, the circumcision was of the Jews, which was made in the flesh by hands. They had to be circumcised on the eighth day to become a true Jew. Remember that you were at that time uh, separated from Christ, alienated or extinguished from the commonwealth or citizenship of Israel and strangers of the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Don't worry, I'll break it down. He said, I want you to remember Gentiles, right into the Ephesians church. You were in the flesh uncircumcised. That means you were unclean, unholy. But God has taken the unclean and the clean and making him a new man. Remember that you were strangers. You were had no covenant, no promise. So from Ephesians 2, verse 1, down to verse 13, he talks about our life, how, what it was. We were without life. We were without strength. We were without Christ. We were without promise. We were without hope. That means promise brings hope. We didn't have a promise, so we had no hope. And we were without God in the world. How is God going to take and build a new man or a new church out of this. That's the stuff that God does. The God kind of things are the things that are impossible with man. They are possible with God. Moving into our lesson in Ephesians, and I want you to look now at the second chapter in verse 13. He talks about here of the pivoting point of the scriptures in verse 13 is one of the pivoting scriptures here are one of the transitional points of this chapter. In verse 13, he says, but now in Christ Jesus. I'm going to slow down a little bit so I can go over this quickly. In 2 Ephesians, verse 1 through 13, remember you had no life, no strength, no Christ, no power, no hope, no God in the world. Then he pivots in verse 13 of Ephesians 2. He says, but now, put now in the chat. Say, now I'm a new person. I know what I used to be. But now, verse 13 of Ephesians 2 says, I'm in Christ Jesus. You who once were far off have been made brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. So I was going to get heavier in this now because we're talking about how he's making this new man. It's through his blood and his values, and how he is establishing this new man through his blood and through his work. This one new man, new man in Christ. Um, we ought to remember the change that Christ has done. We ought to look at our lives and how he has brought about this new man, how the Holy Spirit of God has breathed into us life. He has opened our eyes. He's opened our understanding, letting us peep into this mystery of the revelation of God, this eternal thing coming out of darkness. The darkness has passed. Now the true light is shining into our hearts. The clouds have passed over. The promises now have come. We are appearing like seeing stars as a new morning breaks through. Now we are in Christ because of the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, church, tonight and friends, but I thank God for the blood. And it's the blood that's going to be seen in our lesson tonight, along with the working powers of the Holy Spirit, of how Christ has overshadowed us with the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3 and 18 says it like this, Christ suffered for our sins once for all times. That's the New, uh, New King James Version, 1 Peter 3 and 18. Christ suffered for our sins once for all times. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you and I safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. 
I want you to just meditate on that for a moment to think that somebody would trade places with you and I. Die for us to bring us back to God, making this new man the habitation of what he wanted to dwell in. So he went and preached, the Bible says in that second Peter, first Peter three and 18, went and preached to the prisoners that were in spirit or went and preached to the spirits in prison. Now watch this scripture, first Peter three and 18, making this new man, making this new man. He went and preached to the spirits that are in prison. Who are they? One would ask, who are these spirits in prison? The text bears it out in first Peter three and 18. Those who disobeyed God a long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. There they are right there. Those were the spirits that were in prison. The spirits here being preached to are the same spirits being preached to today. Spirits that are in prison, in bondage. You're captured by the enemy. You're not serving yourself. Are you serving God or are you serving the devil? But here's this spirit that's in bondage and Christ comes to set us free because you and I are going to be a part of this new man, making this new man real. Preach to these spirits in prison and saved their lives and brought us into God's kingdom. And we became a part of the family. While we could not have gotten in any other way, he brings us in and you and I can get in. Anyone else that you know that want to get in, they can get in if they only open their ears to the voice of God. How is this scene, Pastor House? Look at Genesis 6 and 3 in the New, New King James Version. He said, the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive or be patient with man forever. It's only so much striving, so much contending or waiting for man. I'm longing today to bring you into the family of God. It won't be gone forever. The end is certain. The Lord is coming back, but I'm st he's still building his church every day. Even now while I'm teaching and speaking to you, Christ is building his church, adding to the church daily, such as should be saved. Waited, he says, for Noah's day, 120 years. Man's days have been shortened since then. But 120 years, Noah's building that ark and only eight souls, eight people were saved from that terrible flood. The water is a picture of this baptism that Noah then were in. Stick with this now. This baptism that they were in, the boat, but they were in this water, this deluge of water. But he saved them. Eight souls did not drown. Responding to this, it's their conscience that was being washed through getting in this boat and believing God that it was the way of salvation. He was building this new man. Romans 6, 3 and 4, 3 through 4, he says over there, he says, or do you not know that many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ was baptized unto his death? So the ark was a type of baptism that they were going through. It was a type of cleansing. He brought in the deluge of water again to clean the whole earth and started anew. And Noah and his family was in that boat. He said, we were baptized into Christ. This baptism in Romans 6, 3 through 4, it's a type of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I know a lot we compare it to, bear it with him, to rise in newness of, of walk, that we, we paraphrase it to baptism in, in water, to come up in newness of life. But this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit that he's talking about here. And this baptism of the Holy Spirit is coming up as a new body, as a new person through the Spirit, through the power of the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit. When you're baptized in the Spirit, then you're baptized into the power and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Watch it. If the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, it shall also quicken or make alive your mortal bodies. So the devil knows you got power on the inside. And to tap into that power sometimes comes testing, comes trials, comes oppositions, and that power shows itself that you are have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. In this 13th verse again of Ephesians um, uh, 2, he says, uh, all who believe are made, are drawn nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. I believe and you believe. So we come near to him. We have access to God. We can come boldly to the throne of grace because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Ephesians now is where we pivot again in the second chapter, verse 14 and 15. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and broken down the middle wall of separation 
verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of, and the commandments contained in ordinance, as so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Heavy two scriptures there, but it's leading on into the lesson. Peace had to be a peace. Peace had to come about through the blood of Jesus Christ. He is our atonement. He tears down the wall or the separation of the law. That wall was put up from Jews and Gentiles to separate errors. I'm going to bring this wall down and make no barriers between you. Only one new man. And that new man had to come about through making peace through Jesus Christ. I thank God for his peace. If I could put it into another way, I said another way, it'd be like you owed a debt you could not pay. You had a debt you could, you could have owed a debt you could not pay. And only Christ Jesus could pay that debt. And that debt had to be paid through peace. Jesus Christ knew he had to peace the Father. And the only way the Father was going to be peace was by, by the blood of Jesus Christ. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So he did that for us, all to make one new man. Christ becomes our peace for the Jews and Gentiles, breaks down the wall that divides that us, abolishing the law, fulfilling the law, and the commandments that were put against us. The wall or the petition that was broken down was broken down in the temple. God set it up and God had to break it down. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says, but when he said it was finished, the veil in the temple was writ, writ or torn from the top to the bottom. That means that nobody from the bottom ripped it. It was ripped from the top and he broke down that wall of partition. Now he's making this new man in Christ. No prejudice, no schisms, no bigotry. It's one new man. No sexism, no racism. It's one new man. We're all justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank God for moving that all out the way and bringing us into one with Christ Jesus composing again of Jews and Gentiles. I want you to see that in light of either you are Jew or you are a Gentile. And those of you that want to become a Jew again, good luck with that. You can't keep that many laws. You got a ticket last week. Just kidding. However, you must understand Jew or Gentile, it all has to come into one new man. And that man is the man that's in Christ Jesus. The church now composed of the outcome, the outcalled ones, the ones from every nation under heaven. We are now in Ephesians 2 and 19. We are being reconciled to one another as foreigners, as fellow citizens of the household of God, all one in Christ Jesus, bringing, through, bringing us to God, each one of us, sympathizing, fellowshipping with one another, we are one, reconciled to each other and reconciled to Christ or reunited back into Christ. How lucky and how, sorry, how blessed we are to look at us, to know that we're a family of God. And like most families, they're going to have differences, but you're in the family. And once you're in the family, you're a part of the blood. You must understand we must love and look out for each other and make sure we're supporting one another as a family. It's not your church. It's not my church. It's his church. Remember, he told Peter, I will build my church. And this church is the body of Jesus Christ. In this chapter, we see of Ephesians uh, uh, 6 and verse 16, he says, together is we're in one body, we reconciled to God. We're reconciled to God or through Christ Jesus. We are come into fellowship with him. We, we are a group of people that come together by the death of the cross. All this put away that could not be kept. And Christ has united us together with him through the blood of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 and 8, he said, it's by grace we are saved. It's by his grace we are saved, not of our own self, but it is the gift of God that has brought us into this glorious body of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 and 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he had made us accepted in the beloved. Let me read that again. It's time to praise. Ephesians 6 and 1. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted. I want you to just underline that word in your spirit, in the beloved. Accepted means that to have a high quality of favor. 
you are accepted. You remember and you imagine how many people have rejected you over various things. But Christ said, I have accepted you. I accepted you to a highly favored position. You belong to Jesus Christ. He's building his church. So we praise God for the glorious grace that he's set up on our lives, that he's poured out upon us belonging to his dear son, but he poured it out on us. He is so, we, he is, we are so rich in him and his kindness and his grace towards us. He has purchased our freedom through the blood of Jesus Christ. And he did this for the forgiveness of our sins forever. Reconciled, reunited to God. Sin, it separated us, but love brought us back into fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, with the Father. The divine preparation here now is before this glorious purpose could take place. Something has to happen. The enmity I talked about, the enemy had to be torn down. The hostility in Ephesians 2.16 had to be torn down, had to be removed. All the barriers had to be stripped away. That none was righteous but Jesus Christ. And we all had to come to him reconciled, reunited in Christ. He's building his church, building it from the cross, breaking down the barriers, but building it from the cross. Individual nations and between humans, races, breaking down all those barriers and bringing the unique church back together. I'm dropping some things heavy on you, but I'm going to come to the end of it in just a moment. I want you to see not the visible collective body when you come into the church on Sunday, but look around and pew down, every, look the pews, your eyes down every aisle, and look up at the stage, look at the pastor, the musicians, look all around. And to your carnal thinking, sometimes they're not the ones that should be here, then make sure you turn the introspective on yourself and wonder, how did I get in here with all of my stuff? How did God accept me in the beloved? That's the blood of Jesus Christ and the love of Jesus Christ. None of us deserve to be here, but all of us are here because we accepted Jesus Christ and we allowed his spirit to come in and fill us with his power. Here is the great, great goodness of God. We were enemies in our carnal minds, Romans 8, 7 and 8, enemies in our minds and in our flesh and hostile against God. But God broke all that down and brought us into this family, this wonderful family called called the church. Enemies cannot be, we cannot be at odds with one another, but we must remember that because of Christ's goodness, we now have fellowship with him and we're in the church triumphant. Ephesians 2, 17, 18, let's go over it again. He preached, he said, preach peace to you who were far off and you that were near, Jews and Gentiles, Ephesians 2, 17, 18, you that were far off and you that were near, still needed the blood. Jews needed the blood, Gentiles needed the blood, and Christ came and preached that to us, and we accepted and we believed it. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Ephesians 2.18, we have access through Jesus Christ by one spirit to the Father. Union between Jews and Gentiles was a vital thing for Christ to bring about this glorious church. Ephesians 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 said it was by one spirit. One spirit, you're all baptized into one body. Now, whether you're Jew or Greeks or Gentiles, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, one spirit, whether you're a slave or free, you've all been made to drink of the same spiritual drink. Christ becomes the fundamental spirit wherein that all the waters flow. Jesus said in John 7 and 37, if you, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. Now, therefore, in Ephesians 2, 19 and 20, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. Where are you taking me, Pastor House? I'm letting you know you are in the best family in the world. You're in the best place you could be in the church of God. You're no longer foreigners, but fellow citizens. I belong in the family, in the household of God. I am a part of the family of Jesus Christ. Having been built upon the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstones, the apostles and the prophets of so years ago and days gone by, there are 12 apostles. They were the ones and Christ being the cornerstones. The apostles were the builders through revelation and also through the spirit, through the spirit that God was revealing the word to them. They began to be the fundamental things to build us up. These 12 set the foundation 
foundation for the church through the teachings of the apostles. That's why we read the book of Acts and we steadily continue steadfastly in the apostles doctrine. We were built up and established because God put the word in them and they helped us to stabilize ourselves. The continuing of the apostles is in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. This continual apostleship and foundational teachings is equipping and strengthening and edifying the church with knowledge and truth. He gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors or teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Every time you hear the word of God, thank God for the feet of those who bring the gospel that builds and strengthen you up to let you know that Christ is building his church. Each one of us is being constructed and reconstructed and rebuilt by the thank thankfulness of the word of God and the teachings of God. The Bible concludes with us tonight, uh, class in Ephesians 2 and 21. He said, we're all fitly framed together. That's King James. Fitly jointed together is the New Living Translation. We're now fitly jointed together. This church that he is building is fitly framed, being built, and the church now means that God is putting it together. Fitly framed together. He puts into the church everything he needs to profit with all. He fitly frames it, and he, that fitly frame again means it's uniquely and marvelously put together. God has a way of bringing people into the church, his church, his body, that you and I may look and say, what are they going to do? But God takes the base things to confound the wise. You belong in the church. You belong in the body of Christ. Your position is not my position, but every place and every part of us fitly frames together in the house of God. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16 says it like this. We had, we had to speak, had to speak the, we had to speak the truth in love and we may grow in all things unto him who is the head of the, uh, who's the head, which is Christ from the whole, from the whole body is joint. I'm sorry, from the, from the whole body joint and did come together with every joint supplying according to the, the, the differences working by working in us to do his, do our several parts. Let me read it again. Ephesians 6, 4 and 16 from the whole body joint and did come together what every joint supply according to the diff the differences working by which each every part though it's its share shared cause grows up and the body for the edifying grows up the body for the edifying itself in love what i'm saying the body has its own way of making sure that each part makes the other part of the body strengthen are you strengthening someone in the body or are you making are you weakening them weakening them in your actions you should be building them up christ uses us as instruments set in the body to strengthen and build each other up how pastor house through the spirit someone is not spirit led they will be tearing you down and building you up. Progressive, the church is. It's militant. It's stable. It's integrable, but it's progressive. The gates of hell shall not overthrow it. This church is coming up out of darkness, but it's coming up with power. It's being led into something greater and something stronger. It cannot operate out of schisms or divisions or disunity. It must operate out of unity. He said to us again, the whole body is built together to the dwelling place of Christ. This dwelling place of Ephesians 2.22 is where Christ, Christ wants to dwell. I want our church. I want you as the body of believers to be a place where Christ can dwell. Let the church become a representative of Christ within the earth, fitly framed together. Lastly, in 1 Kings 6 and 7, the temple, when it was being built, was built with stone fashioned in, at the quarry so that the human, so that the hammer and the chiming of any iron was not heard in the temple. Note this in the Old Testament, the time of the building of the construction of the temple. It was built and the fashioning of those stones and the, uh, the stones that were put into the quarry, they were built at the quarry before they were brought to the temple. Nothing was built in the temple making sound or hammering noises. You were pre-fashioned before you came in and set within the temple. The temple in Jerusalem without sound 
was being built. Without hammer, it was being built. Without axe, it was being built. What are you talking about, Pastor House? Sometimes you don't hear any muscles or any bones cracking, but the spirit is building you. He's working on the inside, displaying on the outside how you're going to fit into this next hour of the church. He is pre-fashioning us. He's bringing us from the quarry and brought us into the church, set us into the body for his dwelling place. We were there, this ordinary, extraordinary makings of building something and bringing it in and setting it in place is a quiet movement of the Holy Spirit how he operates in our lives to set us in order to become a house not made with hands, a dwelling place by God. This dwelling is of the Lord's. He is building his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Aren't you glad about that? You were not built to be destroyed. You were built to last and hell cannot tear up the church. What is the gates of hell? Any principalities, any governments, any unruly, unruly settings cannot tear the church up. No height, no death, no any other creature can tear down the church. Christ's blood bought, his blood bought, his blood washed, it's been set in place. He knows who you are and knows who I am. And we belong in the church of God. God bless you tonight. I pray that you are tracking with me on this message to know that Christ is building his church and it will not go down. God loves you. We love you. Make sure you stay in the kingdom, stay in the church. Christ has set you in here for a reason and a purpose. He loves you and we care about you. So God bless you, Father. Now I'm blessed now. Strengthen my sisters and my brothers and those that are tuned into this message tonight. Let us know, God, that it was you that have called us, you that have justified us, and you that have set us in place through your blood that we thank you for. For above all principalities and powers, let us walk in the fullness of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you real soon.